I'm going to be the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter number 2, verse 1 through 12. The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. Glory to God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures. Then they, then they, then they, then, then they, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts. They presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Let's go back to verse 11 for just a moment. I want to hear verse 11 again. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Can you say amen? I want to talk from the subject, a gift to the giver. A gift to the giver. Let's pray while we're standing. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh. Fresh like dew upon us. Saturate us with your presence in such a divine way that we know that we have been with you. Because whenever we encounter you, it saturates our soul, it permeates our spirit, it affects the way we live and walk and think and move and have our being. One moment with you can catapult us for months. Tabernacle with us right now. <laughs> Dwell amongst us, oh God. Dwell amongst us. <laughs> Just hang around us. We are thirsty to be in your presence. Now govern the preaching of the word today. Let it go out for edification and not entertainment. Let it inspire and impart virtue unto your people. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Good morning, Potter's house. I greet you with Jesus' joy. I'm excited and delighted to have this opportunity to have a conversation with you that I have been having with God. I have come to observe over the 63 years of my life that some people are givers and some people are takers. <laughs> that some people are so consumed with self-enthroned egotism that they are much better and more proficient at being recipients than they are at being givers and sowing into someone else's life. 
Now I realize during a season like this in a capitalist society, we equate giving with wealth and substance and jobs and zeros and checks. But I wanna dispel this myth right away that giving is not about having money. It's not about stuff, it's not about possessions, it's not about how much you make. Giving is an attitude, it's a disposition. Whether it's giving of service or giving of time or giving of compliments, it's something that happens in you. It's not in your pocketbook, it's not in your wallet, it's in your heart. If it's not in your heart, your wallet can be full, but if your heart is empty, you will never be a giver. See, some of us have a giving spirit. We don't have much, but we got a giving spirit. If we got a cookie, we're going to cut it up and give you some of it. If we got peanut butter and jelly, we're going to make you sandwiches and cut it up and decorate it and present it to you. If we don't have nothing to give you, we're going to help you get something up the steps or help you get your refrigerator moved or do something to serve you in some way. We, we can't stand to sit by and watch you labor while we do nothing because we have been trained to be givers. My mother told me, make people miss you when you're gone. Give them something to say about you. Give them something that if Sally was only here, she would do something. Don't let it be where you can be absent and be no different absent than you were present. Giving is an attitude. It's a disposition. It's part of our characteristic to be like God is to be a giver. For God is a giver. John 3.16 makes it clear to us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Listen at that. God so loved the world that he gave his son. In Genesis, God so loved his son that he gave him the world. I'm going to say that again. In John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his son. In Genesis, God so loved his son that he gave him the world. Our first encounter with God is, a, is wrapping a gift, preparing a world, getting things in order, not so that he might have a dwelling place because God did not need earth to dwell. Heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. God dwells in eternity, we dwell in time. When we first are introduced to our creator, the first thing we find him doing is making a gift for his son. To give that gift to his son is his highest honor. We do not serve a God who is demanding us to give him things without him having first given us. I want you to get that in your spirit. My God is a giver. My God is a giver. If I'm gonna be like God, I gotta be a giver. When I first met him, he was a giver. The first thing I learned about him is that he created the seas and the oceans and the winds and the waves and the satellites and the sun and the heat and the morning and the wind. And he did it all for me to climatize the atmosphere just to the degree that it never got so cold it killed me or so hot that it scorched me when it was climate control. And he put me into an environment from which he created me because you exist best in environments from which you were created. <laughs> it's hard to exist in an environment you were not created. If you were not created in the upper echelon, you feel funny in the upper echelon. If you were not created and raised in the ghetto, you feel funny in the ghetto. If you were not created in the ocean, you, after, you can swim a while, but after a while you're gonna have to get up out of there because you're an imposter. The fish can swim for years and years and years because he was created in the water. He was conceived in the water. He was hatched in the water. He was born in the water. You can only thrive in what you are created in. And to make sure that we thrived in the environment that he created for us, he then scooped up the earth and made us out of it so that we would be kin to it. So that it is not just that God gave me the universe, God created me out of the universe. 
and out of the dust God created man and he became a living soul and he breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul and Adam woke up and said, all of this for me? All these waterfalls and, and mountaintops and streams and rivers for me, all these trees and mountains and sunsets for me, all this crashing of water against the rocks, dashing for me. You mean the dew that falls like mist in the morning was all done for me? You created every flower, every blossom, every tree for me. And God said, I love you like that because God is a giver. He is a giver, understanding that he is a giver. And then he gave it to us and said, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to replenish, subdue, and have dominion. He said, I'm going to make you the boss of it. I'm going to put you in charge of it. God said, I created a kingdom, a king's domain, and then gave you dominion, and you're large and in charge. So the first gift that he gives us is that he gives us a creation. The second gift he gives us in Genesis is he gives us redemption. For when Adam, when Adam messed up the first gift, God said, that's all right, I got another one. He walked through the cool of the garden and found Adam in his sin and his nakedness and said, Adam, you can't gift your way out of this. I've got to give you a gift that'll get you out of this because if you can gift your way out of this, that will be works. I got to teach you grace. So I'm going to give you something you don't even deserve. And the voice of the Lord walked through the cool of the garden and he found redemption. Redemption, and he came and dressed man in custom clothed fur. And we call it redemption. And it was the second gift. And then there was the third gift. The third gift was the gift given to the deceived Eve to regenerate the species. From creation to redemption to regeneration, he says, I invite you as a woman to partner with me in a limited liability partnership where we are going to partner to create life. We are going to re Generate. Are you with me this morning? I, di I didn't bring you a happy meal. I didn't bring you a bologna sandwich this morning. I didn't bring you anything like that. I didn't pack a hot dog this morning. All you peanut butter and jelly people, y'all might as well click off. I came to bring a seven course meal to you to make you understand that God so loved you that he kept giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. And, giving. and that's what this season is all about. Because Jesus is a gift from God. He is still God giving from Genesis to Revelation. God never diminishes in his generosity. He never depletes his resources nor runs out of compassion. His mercies are new every morning. And even as we celebrate this season in our lives, you must understand that Christ himself is God making himself a gift to us. That God steps down into a virgin and says, I need some wrapping paper. And flips around inside of her womb and wraps himself up in humanity. And all of a sudden, God comes stepping from eternity into time, all wrapped up in human form. Emmanuel was a gift to us. And heaven started singing and angels started rejoicing because God had given the ultimate gift. Now God has made himself a gift. Who are you a gift to? If you are a Christian, which means you are Christ-like, you ought to be a gift to somebody. How have you given yourself lately? To someone. Because Jesus is, a, if God made himself a gift, then surely the people who worship God must make themselves a gift, not a liability. 
<laughs> Not a liability. You need to be an asset every day. You need to be a gift to somebody every day. You need to wrap yourself up in forms beyond your normal purview and give yourself to somebody. That's why Jesus later girds himself with a towel and gets down on his knees and starts washing feet because it's always about wrapping yourself in whatever you need to be wrapped in in order to present yourself a sacrifice because God never gives us an unwrapped gift. And that's what Jesus is. Jesus is God's wrapped gift. And that's what the creation was, God wrapping a world to give to his son. God is always giving. He's always giving gifts. He's always giving things like, like, like in shadows and types, God is giving things. That's why he had Jacob to give Joseph the coat of many colors. Yeah, yeah, because he is a giver and he is always giving to his people and he gives it to the boy while he is yet a child. Great God of mercy. I wonder, did Jacob know that he was acting like God when he made a coat of many colors for a kid? A kid that would become the prince of Egypt is crowned ahead of time with a gift beyond his years. Great God Almighty. When God gets a gift for you, it doesn't just have the present in mind, it has the future in mind. When God gives a gift for you, it embraces everything that you shall be. When God gives a gift for you, it embraces your destiny and not your history. In fact, God will give you something on time that's for another time. Oh, y'all didn't hear that. That was so good, I got to happy myself. Don't throw away nothing God gave you, even if it doesn't fit your situation, even if it doesn't make any sense right now, even if you don't understand why God gave you what he gave you, like he gave you, don't throw away anything. Even if they laugh at it, even if they mock it, even if they make fun of it, even if they say you don't need it, hold on to everything God gave you. Joseph, the coat might look silly around your brethren, but when you're walking around Egypt in a chariot behind Pharaoh, they're going to understand that the gift was a prophetic gift. I don't know who I'm talking to today. You got a gift that doesn't even fit your situation, but the gift is a prophetic. It is a prophetic gift from God. I want you to declare right now, I am gifted. Oh, you said that like ABCs. Say it like you believe it. I am gifted. Say it till the devil hears you. I am gifted. If nobody gets me anything for Christmas, I am gifted. If UPS doesn't deliver anything, I am gifted. If FedEx doesn't drop off a package, I am gifted. If nothing is under my tree, I am gifted. I was born a gift. I'm a walking gift. I'm a talking gift. I'm a thinking gift. I'm a moving gift. I'm a functioning gift. I'm an anointed gift. Whenever I walk in the room, you have been gifted because I am gifted. I am a gift. And he gave apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. He said, I made people a gift. Shouted, I am a gift. I am a gift. The Bible says, whosoever findeth a woman, findeth a wife, findeth a good thing because she is a <laughs> glory to God. Make yourself a gift. Well, let somebody find you a gift. Let them find you a gift, an asset, an addition with treasure that you spend the rest of your life unwrapping. We are still unwrapping Jesus. 2,000 years later, we are still unwrapping Jesus, beholding the manifold wisdom and presence and glory and honor of who he is and what he's able to do. We have not yet fully exposed the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All that dwells in him and with him, all of the many things he is, 
All of the I am's that he is are yet to be revealed. All of the cures that he is to diseases, he is the cure before the disease ever came along. He is the answer before the question ever came. He is the solution before the problem ever came. Jesus is the answer. He is a gift from God. Hail Mary! You've been highly favored. What is favored? You've been gifted amongst women. I am going to partner with you and borrow your paper to wrap my gift. And ye shall bring forth a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel. God, tabernacle, or God wrapped amongst us. And we beheld the wonder of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It is this Jesus who is a gift that brings me to the text. <laughs> I am standing at the gate of the text, mesmerized by the majesty of his splendiferous grace. His omnipresence, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his power, his absoluteness, his sovereignty, his ability to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we may ask or think. And yet I am beholding him in swaddling clothes, in a manger, surrounded by shepherds and sheep and goats. And I know that God has caused the star to twinkle as a bow on a gift in a manger to the world. A living gift to a dying world is where I stand on the precipice of understanding who he is. I am mesmerized that all the prophets of the ages all come together in concert to describe the excellency of who he is. I am amazed that all of the Old Testament prepares him and all of the New Testament looks back in awe at him that at this one sliver in time, eternity and time clapped together. Mercy and truth came together. Grace and justice Fuse themselves together or fuse themselves together in a manger, in a trough. <laughs> that God presented this gift in the trough. And when I step into this text, I said, can I preach this morning? Because I feel like preaching. Whether you feel like being preached to or not, I feel like preaching. And then I'm mad at the devil and I'm going to show him. <laughs> I'm going to show him who he's fooling with. I'm going to show him who he's fooling with. He don't understand who he's fooling with. He don't understand who he's fooling with. Somebody give him 30 seconds of praise. He don't know who he's fooling with. He, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, 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 jumped, you jumped on the wrong one. You jumped, you jumped, you jumped, you jumped, you jumped. You jumped the wrong one. You jumped the wrong one. You jumped the wrong one. I got the real Holy Ghost. You jumped the wrong one. Hallelujah. Somebody give him 30 seconds of crazy. Oh, anybody out there got, anybody out there got the Holy Ghost? Any, 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 anybody got the Holy Ghost? Anybody got, any, anybody, anybody got, anybody got, anybody got the what I am getting to is the mysterious Magi who appear only once, no encore. They will not be discussed in Mark, Luke, or John, this is our one and only glimpse at these mysterious magi. Now, because we have confused Bible with Christmas carols, we misrepresent the magi. We take liberties and assumptions because instead of learning scripture, we learn them through songs and art and imagery that creates a caricature that is totally opposed to what the Bible says. Like the Bible never said that they were kings. Like the Bible never said that there were three. <laughs> 
Like the Bible never said that they showed up at the manger. Oh yeah, bring the, bring the mic. Yeah, okay, just, just for backup. The Bible never said that they showed up at the manger. And yet in every nativity scene, we see them in the manger. We see three of them in the manger and we have uh, convoluted truth with tradition. We have diluted scripture with music. We have created this strange caricature of truth because we don't really study Bible. We get secondhand information like people get secondhand smoke. And because we have secondhand information, we have confused the text with the arts. And thereby we think that the wise men showed up at the manger. But the text says they showed up at the house. The text says when the, when the magic came, they came to the house. And the text says that they came after Jesus was born. Put it back up there, Matthew 2, 1. Put it back up. Let me show it. Let me show it. Put Matthew 2, 1 right, right, right quick. Yeah. And Jesus was born after Jesus, after Jesus, after Jesus, after Jesus, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, the Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. He was born and they haven't even got to Bethlehem. They're still in Jerusalem talking to Herod. Oh, y'all got quiet now. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so you have to understand, they came from the east, and they came because they saw the star. They did not come because of prophecy or word of knowledge or because they were theologians or scholars or even Jews. They came because they studied the science then of astrology and they had seen a star and God had revealed himself through a star that had not been seen in the constellations before and they understood that the coming of the star was a sign that a king had come. Good God of mercy. Oh, can I get in this word? Can I get in this word? Anybody come to get in this word? In this word? In other words, they could look at the heavens and tell what was happening on earth. No wonder the Bible said the heavens are telling the glory of God. I don't need a Bible. I don't need a prophet. I don't need a scripture. I don't need a preacher. They said we looked at the heavens and the heavens told us the glory of God. The term magi we refer to as wise men is really a word where we will later get magic because they were the mysterious magi who experienced God through a star. <laughs> you can experience God through anything. You can experience God through an ass. You can experience God through the parting of a Red Sea. You can experience God through fire on the top of the mountain. You can experience God through the dry bones in the valley. You can experience God through a dry riverbed where all the water has dried up. You can experience God. I am that I am preached a message to a star that convinced the wise men that there was a new king that had come. Generally, when the Magi traveled, they traveled in twelves. We get the number three because they gave three gifts, but the Bible never said there were three men. <laughs> they were likely the Nabataeans who controlled the Arabian Peninsula. And therefore, they understood the vitality of trade. Their routes were from Yemen in the east to the ports of Gaza. 
and from Egypt in the south to Syria, Asia Minor, and east to Persia, their capital was Petra, which means rock, which is the stone, was at the crossroads of the two lucrative trading routes where gold, frankincense, and myrrh were not only the Nabataeans' cash crops, but it was also representative of a diplomatic gift. They needed whoever was going to be king to have a good relationship with the Nabataeans because that meant that whoever would be king of Israel would control the trade routes from which the frankincense, the gold, and the myrrh would be moved. They knew that as Jesus became the king of the Jews, he was the door to their blessing. <laughs> Y'all didn't hear what I said. They knew that as Jesus would be the king of the Jews, he would become the door to their blessing. In other words, they were smarter by nature than the Jews of the time were by habit. They without the Pentateuch, they without a temple, they without the sacrifice of bullocks and goats understood that Jesus was a door, understood that Jesus was a gateway, understood that Jesus was the gateway to the future of the trade of everything that they had dug out and hewed out and labored with. And so they brought the fruit of the beating of the rock to get the gold the bruising of the tree to get the frankincense, the crushing of the root to get the myrrh. And they brought that which had been beaten and that which had been bruised and that which had been crushed to that which would be beaten and that which would be bruised and that would be crushed. They brought a gift to a giver. They brought a bruising to a bruising. They brought a beating to a beating. They brought a treasure to a treasure. That's what we're looking at in this text today. It is a gift given to a king who had to be two years old or younger, <laughs> but no longer is in the manger and not yet on the throne. He's in an in-between place. God, God will give you a gift that does not fit where you are but will be for where you're about to go. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it again. God will give you a gift that does not fit where you are, but it is a gift for where you are about to go. I feel the spirit of prophecy in this place. God will give you a gift that is revelatory, that shows your shall be, while you are still in a toddler state of being, God will give you a gift ahead of time. Let me break that down. God will anoint you to be king <laughs> while you're still a shepherd boy. <laughs> God will put a robe on you to lead Egypt while you're still carrying lunches. God will give you a gift that doesn't even fit where you are. I want to talk to somebody who's confused because you know you got something, but you don't know what you got and you don't know how to use it and you don't understand why you got what you got. But God has already given you something for where he's about to take you into. Somebody shout, I am gifted. These men brought a king's gift to a kid. They brought a king's gift to a kid and God is famous for bringing gifts ahead of time, for anointing kids to be kings years before they become kings, for making coats of many colors for princes before they ever become or even enter into Egypt. 
God has given you something that doesn't fit where you are. And don't let anybody make you forfeit what he gave you because it doesn't fit where you are. Hold on to what he gave you. The gift is for an appointed time. In the end, it will speak and not lie. Though the vision tarry, wait for it. Wait for it. It's going to make sense in a minute. It doesn't have to make sense in the moment. It's going to make sense in a minute. You don't understand why you are where you are, what's going on in your life right now. It doesn't have to make sense right now. It doesn't have to fit into the decor of the house. It doesn't make sense for the situation. But soon God is going to show you why you had to go through everything you had to go through. If you think I might be talking to you, give God a praise right now. If you think I'm speaking to you, come on, come on. If you think I'm, if you think I'm speaking to you, if you think God is talking to you, if you think God is saying something to you, open your mouth and give him a praise. Yeah, 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 yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Look at somebody and holler, I got something. Type it out on your computer, I got something. Text it on your phone, I got something. I know I got something. I, I don't understand it, but I got it. It doesn't make sense, but I got it. It doesn't fit into my atmosphere, but I got it. I have been gifted. Let all the gifted people give a sign. All the gifted people give a shout. All the gifted people give a text. All the gifted people give a tweet. All the gifted people make a noise. If you know you're gifted, make some noise. I may be broken, but I'm gifted. I may be bruised, but I'm gifted. I may be hewed out the rock, but I'm gifted. I might be worried, but I'm gifted. I might be in turmoil, but I'm gifted. I might be confused, but I am gifted. Let every devil know I'm gifted. Let every witch know I'm gifted. Let every demon know I'm gifted. He that hath began a good work shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Lord have mercy. I wish I had an old time in church so I could get an old Holy Ghost praise. I wish I had a praise in this place that could step into your death destiny that could step into your future. Somebody that believes God for prophetic worship go into a prophetic praise right in front of your laptop, right in front of your iPad, right in front of your computer. Open your mouth and give God, give God Give God, give, 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 give to the giver, give God. You ought to give him a praise. You ought to give him a praise. You ought to give him a praise. You ought to stop being stingy and give God a praise. You ought to give to the giver. He gave you your shoes. He gave you your feet. He gave you your pants. He gave you your legs. He gave you your hat. He gave you your head. Open your mouth and give God a praise. Praise him until hell gets nervous. Praise him until demons tremble. Praise him until yokes are broken. I need 30 seconds of crazy. You see, that's why some of us can't get our breakthrough, because we can't get our praise right. What the Magi did, before they gave him their gifts, 
they gave him their praise. You're so busy being gifted, you haven't learned how to praise him. But when you forget about yourself and open your mouth and praise him, God will open up a door and give you revelation. I'm going to give you another chance to open up your mouth and give God a praise. I'm going to give you a, yeah, cute you, conservative you, quiet you, give your gift to the giver, give Jesus a Christmas gift, open your mouth. I want to warn, I want to warn all you magic. I want to warn all you wise men. When they talked to Herod, Herod said, go find Jesus so that I can come and worship him too. I want to warn you about fake worshipers. I want to warn you about opportunists. I want to warn you about people who see you headed in the right direction and try to go your way. I want to warn you about people who try to tie into your favor. What God has for you is for you. Don't bring nobody. Don't drag nobody. Don't take nobody. And don't tell nobody. God is about to set you into the fullness of your purpose but you got people hanging on they act like they want to worship like you but they really want to kill your dream the devil is alive I rebuke the spirit of Herod I rebuke the spirit of Herod Herod has got to die I burn your power in the name of Jesus if you got the Holy Ghost Burn Herod now! Now Josephus teaches us Josephus teaches us that the reason Herod had an attitude about the wise men coming is that in 6 BC, they had come to Herod and brought him gold, frankincense and myrrh, so that they could continue to do business in the region. So when Herod saw them coming, he thought they were coming to honor him. And he found out that they were coming to honor another king. And he got jealous. The spirit of jealousy is alive and well in the world right now. You've been trying to figure out why they're trying to kill you. They're jealous of you. They're jealous of what you've got. They're jealous of what God is about to do in your life. Who am I talking to? They're acting like they're worshipers, but they're jealous. And so the wise men came, and when they saw the star, they came to the house. I know it wasn't the manger because the Bible said it was a house. I know it wasn't the manger because Joseph wasn't there. I know some time had passed because later Herod would say, in order to figure out how old Jesus is, I will kill everything two years old or younger. Yeah. 
because the reason Herod wasn't sure is because they never came back to tell him that they had found Jesus. Because while they were worshiping, while they were worshiping, God told them to go back another way. And when I read, go back another way, God told me to tell you, you are expecting to go back to normal. But you are not to cry out for normal. That God is going to take us back. I feel a spirit of prophecy. God is going to take us back another way. Because if we go back to normal, there's a trap in normal that the enemy has set for our demise. We have to be prepared to go back another way, another way, another way, another way, another way, another way. Another way. Another way. Now, this is against the currency of orthodoxy. It is against the grain of normal because people who are normal and traditional are stuck in one way. You can only do things one way. You can only have church one way. You can only do business one way. You can only interact with people one way. But God said you have got to learn how to get back another way. So you cannot tell yourself, I can't help this. This is how I am. I'm just like my mother. I'm just like my grandmother. It is what it is. I am what I am. So no, 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 no. God said you got to be more flexible than that. I'm going to do what you want me to do. But I'm going to, I got to take you another way because the enemy has a trap set for you. Who? Who am I preaching to? The enemy has a trap set for you. And I'm going to bring you back another way. And in order for you to find that way, you have to give your gift to the giver. So the gold was taken out of rocks. Archaeologists have still found traces of gold coming out of that region that was in the rocks. So you had to bust the rocks to get the gold. Christ is that gold. That rock that was shattered. All they were giving him in the frankincense that they had to get out of the white inner part of the tree or the myrrh that came out of the ground is all they were giving him is what he already was. The frankincense was used for incense. The sweet aroma of prayer identifies his intercessive capacity. Can I go a little bit deeper? And we will not hear any more talk about myrrh until he's on the cross and they offer him wine and myrrh to anesthetize his pain. Everything that he will be is in the gift he already has. And so the Spirit says to you, <laughs> how? So the Spirit says to you, you think you're waiting on God to equip you, but everything you shall be, you have already been given. <laughs> everything you will need has already been imparted to you. So don't be bothered if I anoint you to be king and I send you back to feed sheep. It may take 14 more years, but the oil didn't lie. You will be king. And don't be upset when your haters steal your coat. They can take your coat of many colors, but they can never rob you of your prophecy. 
the anointing that I put on you in this season is irrevocable. It is irrevocable. It brought you all the way from where you came from to where you are right now. And I will do a new thing in you if I can only get you to embrace another way. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I've not forgotten you. I'm going to do it. How? I, I've not forgotten you. But I'm going to do it another way. Those magi, however many there were, knew that to bring a gift to the giver was to unlock the future, the pathway, the route, the access for all of the future. Until you stop thinking of church as church, your life will never change. You have to see this moment as the gateway to the fulfillment of your prophecy. And you didn't come to give out of his necessity, but your own. <laughs> because all that you will ever give him, he already is. And all that you will ever give him, he's already given to you. And nothing that is in your future will be able to pass through without him. Because he is the gateway to what is next in your life. So on this Christmas Sunday morning, I felt led of the Holy Spirit to talk to you about the mysterious magic. <laughs> the mysterious magic. And to understand that we bring gifts to the giver. Your God is a giver. And right now in this moment, I'm going to ask everybody in this room, viewing around the world, to give a gift to the giver on whatever level you can. It can be seeds in the ground. It can be the fruit of your lips. It can be in your worship. But I do not want you to stand in the presence of the giver and just be a spectator. I challenge you to be wise enough to be smart enough, to be astute enough, to bring a gift. I bring a gift to the giver of gifts. I lay down a gift. Here's my gift. I worship you. I bring gifts. I've come this far to bring a gift, to offer up a gift to the rock of ages, <laughs> to the rock of ages. I will bring a gift because I shall come forth as pure gold. I will sow a gift. I saw a gift to let the devil know I'm coming out of this better than how I went into it. I shall come forth. I shall come forth as pure gold. I shall, I shall. Somebody needs to release the frankincense of worship into the atmosphere 
and right where you are, you need to give a gift to the giver of absolute Holy Ghost worship. Absolute Holy Ghost worship. Everybody in here ought to bring some kind of gift, some kind, some kind, some kind, some kind of gift. We offer a gift to the giver. Offer a gift to the giver. Bring a gift to the giver. Here is my praise. I don't understand how you could just stand there and just look and not do something. Not sow anything, Here not say anything, not give praise. anything, not raise your hands, not open your mouth, not find some kind of way Here to be responsible enough praise. to give a gift, a gift, a gift, a gift, a gift, a gift to the giver. Here is my praise. Even if it's your life, a gift to the giver. Even if it's your past, a gift to the giver. I don't understand how you could stand to be in the presence of the King of Kings <laughs> and not need him to open up anything for you, not need him to loose anything for you, not need him, not need him to not need him to fix something for you, not need him as a gateway to your future. I, I can't, I can't go into another year without you. I can't go into another moment with it. I can't go with it without you. I can't get it through without you. I can't get it done without you. I can't master it without you. I can't deliver it without you. I can't birth it without you. I can't make it without you. I can't start it without you. I can't build it without you. I can't get safe passage without you. You're the king of kings. My praise, Jesus, I give it to you. I offer it up to you. I give it to you, Jesus, my praise, my praise. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, if you're watching on the internet and you don't know Jesus, if you're watching through your phone and you don't know Jesus, Here is my let me tell you what he wants for Christmas. <laughs> for you to give your life to him is no more than what he did for you. He gave his life to you. Why don't you give your life to him? That's your gift to the giver. I know they're sowing seeds. I know they're planting into the kingdom of God. That's their gift. Your gift to the giver is to lay prostrate and say, Lord, I give you my life and my sins and my struggles and my trials and my tests and I give I give my weakness and my frailty and my vulnerability and my temper and my anger and my craziness and my wildness and my inability to grow up. I give it, I give it, I give it. I just lay it at your feet I, because you're the king. 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 I bow before you. I bow before you. I bow before you. Here is my praise. I bow Here before is my you. Praise, God. Here is my praise, God. Here is my praise. Father, I pray for every gift given to the giver, whether they are tangible or audible or spiritual or the personal giving of one's life. I pray, God, that you would receive it as a sacrifice. I pray, God, that we would go home another way. <laughs> oh, I pray we go back another way. Whatever the devil's got set up, I pray that you cancel it right now. <laughs> whatever's in his plot, whatever's in his plan, I pray that it would go down. Take my life, I give it to you, Jesus. I give it to you. And the Magi went home another way. And they left Herod guessing, looking 
and they couldn't find Jesus because a voice spoke to Joseph and said take your son and your wife and go into Egypt and God said I'm not going to let them get you I'm going to hide you God said I'm not going to let them get you I'm going to hide you I'm going to hide you because these men, these mysterious magi, gave a gift to the giver. And it set in motion the course of events that led Herod to try to kill him and gave Joseph permission to hide him. One final thing before I close. To all of you who serve a broke Jesus. To all of you who can only respect a Jesus who has nothing at all and can only envision him as impoverished. I'm not on the boat that's trying to make you believe that he's rich and riding a Bentley. I'm not trying to say that either. But I'm saying when he was a baby, they brought him gold. When he was a kid, they gave him the gold you give to kings while he was still under two. Joseph is so blessed, he's got to flee with Jesus and Mary because he's got a king's ransom. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh that was given, that was befitting a king. You are not worshiping a wimpy, helpless, distraught, benevolent God. Don't let the manger fool you. He knew who he was. Hey! He knew what he had. He knew what he could do. And I want to challenge you to rethink how you see Jesus. Because I don't know no homeless folk who need a bookkeeper. I don't know nobody in a shelter that needs an accountant. Judas was Jesus' bookkeeper and accountant. I don't know nobody who is as you portray Jesus and in need of an accountant. And I don't know no broke folk who have to pay taxes. And I admit I don't know no rich folk who can get money out the fish's mouth. But that's, that's y'all don't hear. <laughs> you don't hear what I'm saying. But, but I want to challenge you. You got to rethink what your God can do. You got to rethink what your God is. I want to challenge you to rethink what your God is able to do. In times like these. God's going to bless you in strange ways, unorthodox ways, unusual way. Take the brakes off how you see him. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all ye may ask or think. He'll bring it on camels. 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 Whatever you need, whatever you want, Whatever you like. He'll hide you. And for two years, while Herod was killing, Jesus was hidden. Until the angel came and told Joseph, he dead now. You can come home. That which was trying to kill you. 
I gotta quit. Let me stop. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm out there. I can't get myself in. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't get it off me. <laughs> but I heard the Holy Ghost say, that which was trying to kill you is dead now. <laughs> I heard him saying, it's dead now. It's dead. You ain't got to hide. You don't have to worry. I heard God say, it's dead. I don't know who that's for, but I couldn't close this harvest without pronouncing. God told me to eulogize your murderer, your antagonist, your hitman. God told me to eulogize him. He told me not to let you go into another year being afraid of what you used to be afraid of. God said he's dead now. Somebody give him 30 seconds of crazy praise. Somebody give him 30 seconds of crazy praise. He's dead now. He's dead now. He's dead now. He's dead now. He's dead. He's dead now. And so says the word of the Lord. 